Hello, welcome to the Royal Society of Chemistry's discussion panel on wildfires and their influence on air, soil and water. My name is Amy Southall, I'm the Deputy Editor for Environmental Science Processes and Impacts. I'll soon hand you over to Chris McNeil, who is chairing the discussion today, but first I would like to tell you a little bit about the RSC's environmental science portfolio. Before we begin, a reminder that this panel is part of a wider series of events hosted by the RSC in relation to COP26. You can find further information and recordings of previous sessions at rsc.li forward slash COP26. The Royal Society of Chemistry has a portfolio of environmental science journals catering to different aspects of the community. Environmental science processes and impacts, environmental science water research and technology, and environmental science nano are hybrid journals where you can publish traditionally for free or open access for an APC. Environmental Science Atmospheres and the recently launched Environmental Science Advances are both open access journals that currently have their APCs waived. Environmental Science Processes and Impacts currently has a themed issue on the topic of wildfires that is open for submissions until March next year. Guest edited by Alex Chow, who is on our panel today, and Lou Hu. If you are interested in submitting to this collection, you can get in touch with us via our website, email, or on Twitter. We're honoured to have Professor Chris McNeil facilitating today's panel. He studied at Reed College and at the University of California, Berkeley. Following his PhD, he switched his research focus from organometallic chemistry to environmental chemistry. From 1997 to 1999, he was a postdoctoral researcher at MIT, and then he began his independent career as a faculty member at the University of Minnesota in the Department of Chemistry. In 2009, Chris joined the faculty of ETI Zurich, where he continues to apply physical organic chemistry principles to the study of environmental chemical processes. We're honored to have Chris as the Editor-in-Chief for Environmental Science Processes and Impacts. He's a wonderful colleague and will be an excellent leader for today's panel. I will now introduce the speakers for the panel. Firstly, we have Dr. Delphine Farmer, who is an Associate Professor of Atmospheric Chemistry at Colorado State University. Delphine's research focuses on outdoor atmospheric and indoor chemistry, with an emphasis on understanding the sources and sinks of reactive trace gases and particles and their effects on climate change, ecosystems and human health. Delphine earned an MS in Environmental Science Policy and Management and her PhD in Chemistry from the University of California, Berkeley. Next, we have Dr. Sarah, Sarah Styler. Sarah obtained her BSc, MSc and PhD from the University of Toronto and conducted postdoctoral research at the Leibniz Institute for Tropospheric Research. She began her independent career at the University of Alberta in 2015, and in summer 2020, she moved to McMaster University, where she is Assistant Professor of Environmental Chemistry and a Tier 2 Canada Research Chair in Atmospheric Chemistry. Her research group focuses on chemistry of atmospheric surfaces, including desert and urban dust, wildfire particulate matter, and cultural heritage objects. Next, we have Dr. Alex Chow. Alex is a professor in the Department of Forestry and Environmental Conservation and the Department of Environmental Engineering and Earth Science at Clemson University, USA. Dr. Chow re received his BS in Chemistry from UC Berkeley and his MS and PhD from UC Davis. Alex has over 20 years research experience studying, studying watershed perturbation on water quality, including wildfires, hurricanes, forest management, and agricultural practices. Finally, we have Dr. Christina Santin. Christina did an undergraduate degree in biology at the University of Oviedo in Spain, and she also received her PhD from there in 2009. In 2011, Christina moved to the University of Swansea to start her work on wildfires. Currently, she is a Ramon E. Cajal Research Fellow at the Research Institute of Biodiversity in Astoria, Spain, and an honorary professor at Swansea University. Now I'll hand you over to Chris, who will lead the panel. So I'll start off with the, the first question, um, and maybe we'll just go in the same order that I introduced you. Uh, maybe you could, you could tell me a bit about um, what you're working on in the wildfire space and um, how you got into it and uh, you know, whatever else you think is relevant. Delphine. Great. Um, well, so I, as Chris mentioned, um, I live in Colorado, so we are subject to very frequent wildfires. And, and when I moved here uh, about, about 15 years ago, I, it just, it felt uh, anecdotally like every year we had more and more wildfires. And it, it turns out that the data matches uh, that, that anecdotal sense and that in the Western US, we just had more and more wildfires every year. And you can see that in degrading air quality. And so that 
that that experience got me interested in in wildfires and what they were doing because you you see the smoke and it it changes the visibility. We we can't see the mountains in Colorado when there are wildfires. Um, but it also got me thinking about what happens to the air that we're breathing. And, and that, that spawned conversations and interest in wildfire smoke and the chemistry. Uh, and so we started thinking about, about where the challenges were in atmospheric chemistry. And I realized that one of the areas was in understanding those, those the, the emissions right near a very large forest fire and what that chemistry is. And that initiated a, uh, series of discussions um, with some colleagues, and then at the same time, larger discussions across the United States and the, the atmospheric chemistry community started some really large uh, large field campaign discussions. So, so we participated in a very large uh, aircraft campaign called We Can in 2018, uh, directly flying into fire plumes and thinking about that chemistry. And my group was measuring those smoke particles and, and thinking about their emission and evolution. And that, that's really instigated my interest and we've been finding lots of curious chemistry and interesting processes that obviously affect the air that we're breathing every late summer. And, uh, and, and then that starts us thinking about climate effects. So that, that's really been my role and, and how I got started thinking about this problem. Interesting, thank you, Delphine. Uh, Sarah, maybe I could just turn it over to you. Now you're also interested in the atmosphere, but maybe a different aspect. Sure. Um, I will say, though, that there's a lot of similarities um, with, with, with Delphine's background, and in particular, um, you know, this, this moving to the, to the, the West. Um, so I am um, originally from Ontario, Canada, um, and I had no familiarity with the air quality degradations uh, that happen as a result of wildfires. My research background is really in uh, desert and urban dust chemistry. Um, and when I moved to, to Edmonton, Alberta, this was just the year before the large Fort McMurray fire, which caused a, a huge evacuation of a, is essentially an entire city in northern Alberta. Um, and, you know, followed uh, by multiple summers of, of really terrible air quality, walking down the street with, you know, breathing into a scarf in the middle of summer and, and being unable to see across the river valley. So, you know, it was one of those um, sort of changes in research directions that really came from you know, from my own personal experience, I suppose. Um, and so in terms of um, the kind of work that my group is, is doing now, we're really interested in uh, thinking about wildfires in a, a northern Canadian context. Um, what are the um, light absorbing materials emitted by combustion of uh, uh, boreal fuels, uh, for example, which is, which is increasing hugely um, over the past while and will continue to do so in future with, with climate change. Um, and then also we're th interested in thinking about um, not just the air quality reductions at the time, but what are the long-term impacts for um, air quality and health of, of wildfire emissions, including uh, toxic species that are present at the surface of wildfire ash and, and what happens to those species. Um, things like if we have um, smoke going into a city and depositing on building surfaces uh, and staying as residue for certain amounts of time, then you know how, how does that affect air quality and, and health um, through dermal contact, for example? Um, and, and finally, you know, uh, uh, things to do with um, what happens if the material we're burning is, is really contaminated. So um, at McMaster University, I've recently begun to, to work with experts in the area of, of metal emissions from uh, contaminated uh, biomass sources like contaminated peat lens. Um, so essentially what happened was I moved to Alberta and then I started studying wildfires and now it has sort of expanded to be a huge part of my group's research program. Great, thank you. That's interesting. Um, Alex, tell me how you got into wildfires. Yeah, sure. Um, well, first, um, as my research is focused on watershed perturbation, uh, focus on the, how they affect the water quality. And so my actually my uh, graduate research focus on like, uh, agriculture and other things, how they affect the drinking water suitability, like the disinfection byproduct and how the water utility affect the uh, treated waters. But like, uh, and actually uh, until 2013, that's a, one of the largest wildfire uh, called wind fire uh, happened in close to San Francisco. Then people start questioning, oh, how this wildfire affect the drinking water quality. So then I start that wildfire study actually starting in 2013 in the wind fire. That is the third largest uh, wildfire at that time. And with my uh, postdoc advisor, Randy Dogwin at UC Davis, so we work together to collect the wildfire sample, uh, especially talking about a water sample and soil sample. And start 2013, I start, you know, 
kind of like the wildfire tracer to look for different wildfire each year. So try to sample a uh, post fire storm and looking for that. Um, one focus we'll focus on the um, uh, water tripability, how they affect the water utility, uh, how, how the disinfection by product on that. And also another part is looking for the, uh, the, um, the dissolved black carbon. I, we expect like different uh, DOM, dissolved organic matter produced under fire will be different before and after burn. Uh, also, um, besides looking in California, I also work with the people in Colorado too, uh, looking at the Heyman fire. We are not looking just for the short term. We are also looking for long term, like after that, like 10 or 20 years, how the landscape changes, how they affect the water export, how they affect the water tributability there too. And um, right now I'm in South Carolina and we have a lot of prescript fire patties. So we also, I also, my group also examined the, the prescript fire impact on the soil water quality too. Yep. Great, thank, thank you, Alex. Um, Christina. Yeah, you're, well, you're, you're really, uh, you can even see some wildfires behind you, it looks like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the fire is always around. So actually, uh, I guess my relationship with fire started long ago because I'm from the northwest of Spain and actually we do have a lot of fires. They are nothing compared to the big fires you guys have in Colorado or in Canada, they are very small. So actually the smoke pollution is not such a big issue, but they are very recurrent. So we do have a lot of environmental impact from these fires. So since I was little, I was really upset about the, the landscape being burned. And during my PhD, I work on soils. So I'm a biologist, but I do some chemical um, chemistry to, to understand the impact in soils and then during my postdoc I decided to move to the wildfire topic because yeah it's something that has been very close to me uh, so that's how I started in 2011 in Swansea University with Professor Stefan Dorf and we actually started focusing on carbon but not on the carbon that leaves so everyone is interested in you know okay we we emit a lot of carbon with the smoke and with gases, but what is going on with the carbon that remains? So I could say my main topic is pyrogenic carbon in charcoal and in ash. And then we we started to, to expand on our wildfire research. Um, we do a lot of uh, wa uh, water quality uh, with ash, ash erosion. I guess we'll talk about uh, more about that later. And now we are also doing fire behavior, modeling, fuel modeling, and very importantly, we are also looking into social perception of fire. What is not related to chemistry, but it is yeah, really important if we want to understand uh, the fire itself. Great, thank you. Thanks uh, everybody for those introductions. That's that's really interesting. So one of the things that um, kind of caught my ear, um, which is while while Alex was talking, is he mentioned uh, a time scale of decades for some of the effects. And I thought maybe that would be an interesting thing because you guys are all working in different systems, you know, soil systems, water systems, air. What are the time scales that we're talking about? What are the, you know, so on, when you guys are doing an atmospheric campaign, you know, what are the, the timescales we're thinking about? Yeah, that really jumped out at me, actually, too, um, Alex, when you mentioned that you were thinking about this on decades, because I think about wildfires in terms of the near field. And by that, I mean the first six hours of a wildfire, that there's a huge amount of chemistry occurring. And that's the time period I was really, I've really been thinking about in terms of chemistry. And then in terms of impacts, maybe a couple of days for transport across across the continent to, to think about air quality effects. Um, but but that's the time split scale that, that I've been thinking about. And I'm not sure if, if Sarah maybe thinks about them on slightly longer time scales. Um, but but it's interesting to think about the air being interesting on the first on hours to days. And then I think the soil and water obviously being longer. Yeah, I think um, that's definitely the kind of uh, time scale that I'm thinking about things from uh, as well. I would say that um, one of the things that we're doing at the moment is um, putting out little samplers in different wildfire affected areas uh, to look at deposition of, of, of particulate matter onto surfaces and then to look and see how long does any kind of signature of, of wildfire 
um, emissions actually last. And I'll say that I have actually no, no idea at this point because the samplers are, are still out. But um, the idea is if things are sticking on surfaces in, in urban environments, for example, you know, then the, um, the signature of those wildfire events could, could last a lot longer after the um, you know, inhalation hazard is passed. Uh, but I, I certainly haven't thought about things on a decade time scale. So it's, it's an entirely different uh, order of magnitude, I suppose. Uh, it is. I mean, I uh, and also I think like uh, Devin and Sarah maybe focus on uh, during the at the wildfire effect. And but like for water people, like because when there's a water, there's no fire. So we have to usually like in California, that's like talking about like the the wild uh, the surface one off from the uh, precipitation. Probably like particularly in California, talking about like three to six months after the fire before we have surface one off. And so that we are talking about like a different time scale uh, for, for the study. And also um, when we're talking about the, uh, well, and, and also like different like first year after the fire and also a decade will be different because like we expect like uh, a lot of ash and other things will be flushed out during the first um, couple of wind storm. Um, but then after, you know, the long term, we are talking about like maybe charcoal and something slowly maybe leaching off this uh, 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 nutrients and chemicals. And also if the landscape has been, you know, uh, you know, destroyed and, and the tree has been gone, we are also talking about the nitrogen deposition biogeochemical cycle in the whole watershed has been, been modified and have been alternated. So, and then talking about uh, one, one study, I'm talking about the nitrogen has been, you know, uh, cycle has been changed in the burn landscape uh, in the Heyman fire. That is like 15 years after we still see, see, see the difference compared to non-burn sites. Interesting. Yeah, Christina, what, do you, what is your perspective? Yeah, just to add, well, in soils, if I, I will talk a little bit about soils because I guess there and the water has been already, have been already covered, but I guess in soils we can see immediate changes so that those direct effects when the fire is affecting the the soil itself that actually sometimes or most of the times i would say are not the most important ones of course they are when we think about these super severe fires again as you guys can find in in the western us or canada but in other type of fires the in the uh, indirect effects, like the changes in vegetation cover, for example, those can translate into longer term changes in the soil. And then coming back to pyrogenic carbon or charcoal, uh, of course, the paleo environmental researchers, they use charcoal to trace the environmental in the, the, the environment in the past. So we are talking about thousands and thousands of years, and we still have that charcoal in the soils, in the sediments, in the waters. And that charcoal is important from the carbon sequestration point of view. So yeah, I think with fire, we can cover all different temporal scales for sure. Chris, yeah, I just want to oh, add- Oh, jump in, yeah. Yeah, sorry, I just want to say that one, one thing you pointed out is actually um, a, a great point that when you start thinking about things on climate basis, uh, in, in terms of climate change, wildfires can have effects on lots of different timescales. So, Sarah and I often think about um, particles, which have a lifetime in the atmosphere of about a week, and they can have some pretty impressive effects on, on the radiative balance of the planet. But uh, you also get all these emissions of greenhouse gases, which can also really shift the time scale of, of climate change, but they have lifetimes on the order of, well, decades for methane and, and, and centuries to much longer time scales for, for carbon dioxide, of course. And so that's, I think there's another piece there. And I think your, your comment, Christina, about, about paleoclimate, I think is, is really, really well taken from that context. Absolutely. Actually, I was going to also just take the chance because it came up already, which is about ash. And I think that, you know, maybe you guys who study fires know what ash is, but I think that, you know, for casual chemists or casual listeners, maybe we don't think about ash. Well, so Chris, maybe I could ask you first, like what, what is ash? What is, what's the main components and why is it important or why are you interested in it? Okay, I'm smiling because you, you wouldn't imagine how many hours I have spent with other colleagues discussing what ash is. So it's a little bit like a philosophical question, I think. I guess for most people, ash, when, when you, especially chemists, uh, when you think about ash, is this like completely mineral residue left after complete combustion? And it's completely white and it's produced in the lab. So that's what 
many people think and use the term ash fall. When we go in the field after a fire, and it, it needs to be quite soon after the fire because uh, ash is very mobile. But anyway, when we arrive there, you find kind of a layer of this powdery residue that is a mix of things. It's it has some mineral ash because some of the fuel. So when when we talk about fuel in fire science, we talk about vegetation being burned. So anyway, some of the fuel has been uh, burned very complete. Uh, completely. Then some of them it hasn't, so it has created pyrogenic carbon. So there is some organic carbon, char organic carbon within the ash. Sometimes you even have some soil that has been burned so much that has lost the structure and been uh, incorporated into the ash layer. So it's really for for me as a I don't know wild a wildland fire person. That's the ash definition we use and. The, the reason is we go in the field and we just collect that, that, that powdery fine residue. I do remember a, a lecturer once telling me, oh, no, 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 you need to go there and, you know, uh, pick up the white ash and the black ash. And I was like, okay, good luck with that. <laughs> so, so what, like, why, why should I be interested in ash in, in terms of like, you know, like what are some of the environmental effects of, of the ash? Yeah, well, I guess Alex can say a little bit uh, more, like uh, focus more on the chemistry, but I think ash is actually, to start with, because ash is always produced in landscapes, uh, in burned landscapes. Sometimes, not a lot, but sometimes we can have even uh, tons, like even up to 100 tons per hectare of ash produced. Secondly, because this ash is just on the soil surface. It's very mobile by wind, Actually, so we can have some air pollution from that ash in the medium term. And it's also very mobile by water, this post-fire uh, rainfall that Alex was uh, talking about earlier. And ash, if you think about it, it's just uh, the vegetation that has been burned. So ash is just concentrating a lot of elements. And therefore, it has the potential to, to be very, uh, very important as a pollutant uh, because it is highly enriched in nutrients and sometimes in heavy metals and in other organic contaminants. But I, I let Alex to explain the more chemistry part. Yeah, Alex, perfectly then. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, yeah, thanks, Christina. I mean, I, yes, the, the first thing I want to add is the mudslide. There's a lot of, you know, problem after the rain. I mean, I, when it's, uh, it's happening like a um, few times in California, cause a lot of casualty. Uh, because the must lie from the wildfire. That is one of the problems for the ash production. But in terms of the chemistry, first, I think that most people consider is inorganic, okay, because most people think about burning stuff. Um, but actually, that's not actually in wildfire. It can, you know, with soil, uh, it's not complete combustion. No matter how severe the fire, there's still some kind of organic mixture left in it. So um, that actually is a, a, a totally different terrestrial uh, substance or matrix for leaching the dissolved organic matter or affect the water quality and soil quality. I mean, like for example, like most people look at the calcium carbonate because the burn, it can affect the soil pH. That is most people look at it. And also they maybe have a lot of metals, heavy metal and other things in the ash material. But my research work is focused on, on the organic, even though we consider ash, actually there's a lot of uh, organic uh, materials in it and, and it affects a lot of dissolved organic carbon. In part particular, we are not talking about dissolved black carbon. That is a different story from most people talking about the black carbon we are talking about before. And um, also I'm also related to the atmosphere chemistry that talking about the black carbon stuff here because it's interesting that that black carbon is talking about from depending on who you are talking. If you are talking Sarah and Jeffrey, they don't like it because it can you know block the sunlight, cause the greenhouse and other things. But in terms of the soil chemistry, some people black carbon is a good carbon because it can be sequestrating in the soil for thousands of years. Okay, we are people thinking about the black carbon store in soil for for soils. But then now we are talking about water now that we're talking about black carbon leaching into the, the river and the uh, water system is an, another new thing. The dissolved black carbon is a new topic. And first we are talking about how to treat this water. It can be different from what happened 
talking about unburned terrestrial forest. I mean, that is a, a, a people understand how to treat it, but okay. But after fire, you mix with ash and dissolve black carbon, how to treat this black carbon in the water. This is a, a, a new topic and uh, it's still under a, a study. And also the black carbon, how they affect the degradability and also the nutrient cycle is new too. Because um, the oxygen, you know, uh, you know, the carboxyl group and other attach on the, you know, uh, the, the PAH, the carbon, it can change the, the, uh, the, the, the phase and also the degradability. They may be more uh, easy to degrade, uh, but don't know yet, but you need more study on that. Interesting. <clears throat> Actually, something you, you guys brought up um, got me thinking about um, fires in pristine environments versus polluted environments and um, how that could be uh, a bit different. I, anybody got it, something they could talk about on that topic? Uh, well, I can say that the, the question of, uh, of what you're burning and the fuels that you're burning is becoming a sort of an emerging question in terms, certainly in terms of atmospheric chemistry and air quality. The reason being, being rather tragic that when you burn buildings, you have a lot of building materials that are made out of some really interesting, interesting compounds. And, and there's a lot of questions about what the chemistry is of those, of those sort of human-made substances when they combust, uh, and then how does that change the air that we breathe? And I'm, I'm not sure people really thought much about that yet, about in soil and water systems, but, but uh, wildfires, when they hit that urban, urban interface, are, are becoming an emerging concern. So this is becoming a, a hot topic of research, and I, I don't think people really know the answers yet, but, but it's a question. Chris, you're, you're telling me about um, the Chernobyl uh, forest um, being a potential worry. Um, what's the story there? Yeah, so I just let me say that I completely agree with Delphine. For example, the ash, there is not a lot of uh, information about uh, um, residential ash. Sometimes some people call it like that, but the information that is there is really scary because the amount of pollutants is like order of magnitude uh, higher than in the wildland uh, fire ash. But anyway, Chernobyl. So yeah, as everyone knows Chernobyl, I guess, especially now after that super cool TV series that I really recommend if you haven't watched it yet. Uh, so um, this panel yeah. is not supported by the, by the, <laughs> <laughs> by the producers of the show. So, so around Chernobyl, of course, is what we, we, we call the exclusive zone. So it's highly polluted area. Uh, nobody can enter, or almost nobody can enter. So therefore, no land management can be done. And the forest has grown back. And it's actually really interesting. I have a colleague who, who um, studied the biodiversity in Chernobyl because it's, it's, it's amazing is super high because of no human impact despite of the the crazy uh, radiation levels they have but anyway that's another story so that forest is really dense right now and that area is already affected by cl climate change so the fire risk is increasing so in 2020 there was a fire that was quite big and that's a little bit of that red of the red forest within the um, the Chernobyl explosion zone so everyone was really really worried and luckily enough it didn't spread but it's going to happen. It may not happen next year, but it may happen in 10 years. So, and we don't really understand. We know there is a lot of radioactivity and a lot of potential for it to be released in the smoke, in the smoke, so it can affect very, very broad um, spatial scales. But also in the ash, we have seen there is a, quite a lot of radioactivity concentrated in the ash. So what is going to happen in the waters around there, for example? So that's, those are really, really interesting and important questions, I would say. And terrifying <laughs> questions too. Uh, continue the sort of horror Please. movie aspect of this uh, or segment, I guess, of this uh, panel discussion. Um, you know, this idea of sort of creating new contaminants by the fire or mobilizing old uh, deposited contaminants, I think, is 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 really important. And in um, in context of of um, areas where you have uh, large um, 
or sort of PT environments. Uh, you know, peat is a, a really great reservoir for for different contaminants. And so, if you are in regions like in you know northern Ontario, for example, in Canada, where um, you have uh, huge amounts of industrial activity that have released, for example, metals into the environment, you know, through smelting or or mining or whatever, um, you know, the the peat um, the peat stores are a really great uh, sequestration environment for for those types of emissions. And so, you know, essentially, if you have an area that hasn't burned, then you basically have a repository of all of the sort of post-industrial revolution emissions that's, you know, stuck in this, you know, meter of peat or whatever, or less, much less actually, sorry. And, uh, you know, then the idea is if those areas are are, are burning, then that's just this huge um, release of, of materials back into the atmosphere and back into ecosystem, like local and potentially farther away ecosystems. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's important to think about what's burning if, you know, if you're burning um, modern stuff, uh, but also important to think about what has already been put into these um, supposedly pristine ecosystems, I suppose. So sorry, that's also uh, no, perfect. Secondary. <laughs> no, definitely perfect. I mean, so, it, you know, this gets actually, maybe I should just quickly say, by the way, audience members, anyone who's here at, watching this live, um, you have an opportunity to interact with the Q&A tool in, in the Zoom webinar. And so you can ask questions um, in that. And we will, can, if we have a, a chance, we'd, we'd like to answer them. But um, but maybe just uh, going from there, I was just thinking about um, you know fire management is uh, or you know management of forests to um, to sort of minimize future fires uh, or minimize the the magnitude of future fires wildfires um, is is a hot topic of course hot topic haha -ha. <laughs> but uh, you know I grew up in Arizona um, and there, you know it's, you think of the desert but it, the surrounded all the surrounding mountain ranges are all forested wildfires every year but of course also prescribed burns you know and there was always the, and the tension in the community you know like we don't really want prescribed burns because you know I don't know we want to golf that day or whatever it is and um, but uh, but it got me thinking a bit about the differences and what do you guys see as the differences between like, what are the, is it just really a, a magnitude or is there differences in the chemistry and the, the, the temperature of combustion, uh, you know, the, the releases, uh, what are some of the differences between sort of a prescribed burn and a, a wildfire? Who wants to take, take a first stab? Delphine, you look ready. Yeah, I, I can take a first stab. I mean, there's, and I think you just you just hit the the nail on the head with your sort of question: is it is it just temperature or is it and, and or is it magnitude? And both of those play a role. So so usually the prescribed burns are um, they're not as intense, so they're not these these huge massive flaming fires. Um, they're 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 really there to get rid of the understory. Uh, and to burn the sort of easily easily burnt fuel at a low temperature in a controlled manner. And so that creates different emissions of carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide, but it also changes the amount of smoke you can get. You can actually get a lot more particles and they're slightly different in composition, but it's not, um, it's really, I think it's really the magnitude that changes the impact. So, so prescribed burns tend to be much lower in magnitude and they're much shorter in time period. So when you get when you get a prescribed burn in a region, it's for for a few hours. When you get wildfires, a large wildfire is days, and you're looking at very different um, just spaces. The 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 uh, area burnt is very very different in general, and so I think that's that's really certainly from an atmospheric perspective. That's the larger issue is the the both the intensity, the amount of biomass that has been been burnt, but then it's also that area and how, I mean, one thing that the temperature does that's really important is the prescribed burns really impact the local area because uh, there, you keep the smoke levels and the temperature relatively low. And so that means that plume of smoke only goes into the local, the local region, into the neighboring town. But when you have a large wildfire, you get a lot of temperature and that pulls that smoke plume really high up into the atmosphere. And that can that means that the effects are going to be not just local, but they're going to be regional and potentially global. And I mean, I think the most compelling example of the last few years were those terrible wildfires in Australia. And, and you could see that smoke plume with satellites move all the way around the globe and it could inject extremely high, potentially even into the stratosphere. And that that's a really that that's a very different order of magnitude with very different effects on climate and not just air quality. 
Yeah, it's interesting. So, Alex, if I do a prescribed burn in my watershed versus a, have a wildfire in my watershed, um, you know, what's the, uh, I mean, do you even see a signal like at the water treatment plant, for example, downstream? If it's a prescribed well, yeah. burn? Well, uh, yeah, that's that's good question. Actually, uh, we're using the uh, uh, a prescribed watershed, I mean, uh, uh, experimental watershed in South Carolina. We do a prescribed burning on that. Um, well, actually, in terms of the water treatment point of view, it's better because like um, we saw a, a burnt watershed actually uh, for long term, it released less dissolved organic carbon into the water hmm. uh, compared to unburned. Um, I, I always use a tea bed effect as example. Uh, the detrital layer actually is just a tea bed, right? So thicker it is, so more tea color DOC leaching into source water. So that may be more problem problematic for the water utility downstream to treat it. So that means you need to add more chemical to remove the dissolved organic carbon. But on the other hand, if you do the biscuit burning, so the detrital layer getting thinner, so that will be less dissolved organic carbon into the source water. And the two first order experimental watershed in Santee experimental forest, watershed 77 and watershed 80, uh, that is the number. Um, they as 77 has been burned uh, heavy three or four years for like 20 years. Well, actually more than that. And the other one is un a control not, not doing this. And we saw the DOC has been reduced uh, uh, at least like 20 to 30 percent on that. Um, so that it helped the water in this way actually make the water utilities much easier uh, on that. And then we're also doing the chemistry look at the uh, using the high resolution mass spectral photometer to look at the mo uh, DOM molecule and also try to add the chlorine to look for the disinfection by product formation in terms of the reactivity. And I don't, we don't see much difference. So overall, the P, uh, the P fire, we saw it, uh, we saw it is, is uh, a better in terms of the, uh, the water quality. Uh, People may question, okay, how this one in South Carolina, but also we do a similar study in uh, California in Sei Chen, uh, next to the, uh, it's one of the Berkeley uh, experimental station. And we do have a pile of burning because they are not, uh, it's different type of burning technique. Uh, but also we do a pile burning in a watershed scale. After that, we do a one year sampling. We don't see much uh, a spike. Uh, we don't see anything in terms of the carbon and mercury. Uh, we don't see a difference. So I think if a good management of uh, prescript burning uh, in terms of the water quality uh, for our, based on what we did in the last 10 years, it, 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 it's good things. That's and super interesting. Sarah, it looks like you're about to say something. Follow up it. on that. Yeah, I'm, please. I'm, uh, this is entirely not my area of expertise um, at, at all, but um, you know, I mean, I guess another thing about the controlled burns versus or prescribed burns versus um, uncontrolled burns is that, you know, as is suggested by the name, you control where the burn is is happening. Um, and so um, my understanding via reading various terrifying news articles about this is that if you have, um, you know, really um, large wildfires uh, that are burning in areas where you have some of this water infrastructure, um, then you can actually have contamination of some of the water delivery systems, uh, the plastics in, in the pipes and things like this, and you can actually have um, leaching out of, of volatile organics, you know, into the water over huge amounts of time after the fire. So, um, you know, the idea is if you're if you're showering or something, then you can be sort of inadvertently exposing yourself to, you know, benzene or something that's coming out of the pipes. Um, and so that's less of a, um, you know, something that can be fixed by water treatment, you know, plants or facilities because it can be also downstream of there. And that's, uh, you know, just another sort of dimension to things, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. No, actually, it got me thinking as I was listening <clears throat> to Alex speak, I was like, oh, well, that's really good news. You know, it prescribed burns, if it's a good management tool and it doesn't really affect, you know, this could be, this this is good. And then I was thinking, oh, but that that kind of takes a tool maybe away from the scientists a bit. Like if you're trying to study wildfires, you might want to go and study a, a prescribed burn, you know, seems perfect. But if they're actually fundamentally different, <laughs> it might be a challenge. But it got me thinking just in general about the challenges of studying these episodic events and how do you do it? And so I don't know what, like you write a grant proposal, I'm going to study wildfires. And then the next three years, you don't 
seeding wildfires in Colorado, what do you do? I guess maybe you don't have to worry about that, but anyway, Delphine. Yeah, I'll say, I'll say the really sad part is we don't need to worry about that in Colorado. Um, climate change is, is becoming extremely apparent. And so we, we do get wildfires every year. What is challenging is trying to predetermine where those fires are going to occur. So we get wildfires in Colorado, but Colorado is a very large state. Um, I think we could probably fit multiple Switzerland's in, right? It, it's, it's a large place. And so you have a um, you have a, a lot of different areas and they all experience different levels of drought, different different types of fuels. And so um, we, you know, we don't experience substantial local wildfire smoke in Fort Collins every year. We, we definitely get transported smoke every year now, unfortunately. But, um, but it's very hard to determine where on a local level you're going to experience smoke. But it's very easy to say that if you're in a mobile lab, whether that's a vehicle or a plane, then you can, um, you can definitely find hot spots. And you can say, well, if you look in the Western United States or you look up in the boreal forests, if you were able to travel some amount of distance at certain times of year now, you, you're very assured of getting, getting that smoke. But if you want to think about things like personal exposure to wildfire smoke, that's a whole different ballgame. And I, I think that's, that's much more challenging to predict. So you have to be much more nimble as a researcher and Prescribed burns have actually provided a lot of benefits from that perspective, from a research perspective, because if you know there's going to be a wildfire, um, my group has literally packed up our instruments and, and <laughs> tried to run over and, and we get about a week or two notice from the you know, US Forest Service that there'll be a prescribed burn and we can try and make sure we're there. Um, and that, but that, that also can skew your interpretation of the data because as Alex and Sarah point out, it's, it's those fires aren't the same. They're, they're not necessarily um, the same chemistry. So, so it, it's a challenging, challenging system to study. I think related to that, um, uh, you know, it, of course it's it's super challenging to figure out where to, you know, fly your your huge um, science plane or your smaller science planes or really any planes, I suppose. But um, one of the things that um, my my group and um, a PhD student in my group, Iris, is planning on doing next summer is to is to sort of um, send out some sort of distributed sampling network um, materials to people, uh, you know, in different hotspots across uh, the United States and Canada, um, with you know small passive samplers uh, that we can get time integrated information of about how much the sort of smoke is. Um, wildfire smoke is affecting uh, composition of surfaces in those different areas. And so it, it makes it a lot, a lot easier if you can just send out some, you know, um, model um, window surfaces to different people and have them just kind of stick it outside and, and mail it back. It, it removes the need to, uh, you know, to measure things in real time. Um, but, you know, of course, the the time integrated impacts tell you something, but they don't tell you the same thing as as the kind of measurements that you can get through those real time through those real time measurements. So it's certainly a challenge to think about, you know, what's the um, uh, total effect of these um, episodic emissions versus what's the the peak effect of these episodic emissions. Um, so that that's complicated as well. I mean, one one of the challenges when you're studying any environmental system. I mean, field work is, is, I mean, it's sort of the field work paradox, I guess. Um, the clear sky, the clear sky, what is the clear sky bias in atmospheric chemistry? Um, where you, you have, you know, you have more data points on clear sky days, but, <clears throat> but I guess maybe do you guys already have a sense for, um, like if you have, let's say emissions of say nitrogen, um, from a, from a system, um, and you have enhanced emissions from the wildfire, but the wildfire is short in duration. Like to what, but if you integrate over say a year, like is, is the wildfire nothing or is it a big part of the story? And I, I just picked nitrogen, but is there something where wildfires are a big part of the story that, um, that we haven't, that maybe I don't know about? I mean, one thing I was thinking about was nutrients, like some nutrients, um, move, uh, don't move, well, some nutrients move across watersheds, you know, like sulfur can go from this watershed to that watershed to the atmosphere. But phosphorus doesn't really do that as facilely. There's not as many volatile phosphorus species. 
but I feel like a wildfire might mobilize phosphorus. I don't know. I don't I'm just I'm making something up. Chris, I don't know. Christine, do, do you have any insight there? Or? Yeah, well, actually, wildfires, uh, there has been a recent paper a couple of years ago in PNAS where they suggest that through phosphorus increasing in the ocean because of the fires, uh, there was an increase in, in phytoplankton activity and therefore an increase in O2 in the, so I'm, I'm talking about like affecting the, the whole, the whole, um, the climate of the, the whole globe. So that was an hypothesis and it, it wasn't proved. It, as far as, as I know, I, it hasn't really been proved. But for example, there was a couple of, a few, uh, a few weeks ago, there was a, a paper in Nature where they have seen phytoplankton blooms in the Arctic Ocean. Uh, sorry, not Arctic, Antarctic in the uh, uh, ocean because of the fires in Australia in 2020. So that's obviously is, and that was related to iron. So it's very oligotrophic uh, waters. And I think it was over 10 times of a uh, magnitude the phytoplankton uh, bloom. And it was actually quite interesting because in the same issue in nature, there was some estimations of the carbon emitted by these fires. And then these guys calculated that almost as, as much carbon was actually uh, taken by the phytoplankton bloom. So that indicates that there is so much we still don't know, don't understand if we want to think about fire in the in the very big context. But uh, yeah, for sure, nitro um, nutrients, uh, the the movement of nutrients uh, out of the immediate landscape is is a big issue with fire. Uh, I, I want to add one point beside uh, the burn it, uh, but the firefighter to using the, the suppression agents like ammonium sulfate and other ammonium phosphate, mm -hmm. you know, from the airplane, you know, to add it, try to, you know, uh, to, you know, to, to, to contain the fire. Those are also have a nitrogen and phosphate rich chemicals too. So they can also not from the wildfire itself, but the firefighter adding those chemicals could also release the nutrients to, to the water. So, uh, yeah, that, that's another concern. And that's uh, really fascinating. So do you know, um, so what, what were those compounds again? Uh, I mean, I usually am ammonium sulfate or ammonium phosphate. Um, so that, those are like fertilizers. <laughs> uh, well, uh, I, I'm not the expert on that, but that's what I, I know. That's what. Wow. Uh, wow. I did not know so, that. Yeah. So that, that is cause of, well, will will uh, cause the problem to the. Uh, yeah. To the yeah. Oh, fascinating. Um, okay, so uh, I'm going to change the the focus just quickly. So imagine um, you've you know we, you're you're a student. You've got a we've got some students watching this live, or we're going to watch it recorded, and they they're now convinced that this is absolutely what they want to get into. They want to get into become a a scientist who studies wildfires. Um, maybe maybe two ways to answer this. One is you know what should they do? What should they study? you know, which direction, you know, what, what should they like focus on in their studies to sort of prepare them? And another thing, maybe you could anticipate where you think we will need people in the future, <laughs> if you can imagine that. Um, so either one of those or both of those, anyone want to take a first stab at that? Sarah, <laughs> please go. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, one way that you could think about it is, um, you know, is that I have no specific training in wildfire related things what whatsoever yet here i am ostensibly on this expert panel so that's one strategy is to study entirely different things and then eventually move to a smoky city and change your entire research program um but i mean in terms of you know specific skills i think you know from the atmospheric chemistry perspective it's always helpful to have um a, you know a, a background in um in in chemistry and the kind of reactions that can happen in the atmosphere and, and to think about things from a chemical standpoint um, and then from an analytical chemistry standpoint, um, you know, all of the instrumentation that um, Delphine and her colleagues are using on, on planes, I mean, they're often home built um, and simultaneously extremely complex, um, you know, and so there's, there's a lot of um, uh, sort of engineering and design and skill that goes into um, operating and um, troubleshooting those instruments. And so, 
an appreciation for analytical chemistry and instrument building, um, anything like that is, is, is really, really helpful as well. So I think sort of a, a mix of fundamental chemistry knowledge and, and technical skills, um, I think would take students uh, far in, in, you know, wildfire atmospheric chemistry or really any area of atmospheric chemistry for that matter. Yeah, I would also affirm that I think one of the things that has uh, really intrigued me about getting thinking about wildfires is that it's such an interdisciplinary topic, and I think this panel, um, you know, really highlights that it's hard to just think about one aspect. Even if if I'm thinking about the chemistry in a smoke plume in the first few hours and organic aerosol particles and what's in them, I I also have to be thinking about the fuel that was being burnt, and so that means I. I have a little bit of a background with forest ecology and that's turned out to be extremely useful because I can, I understand what, you know, Alex and Christina are talking about and the nutrient cycling. It actually, there's some really fascinating links to the atmospheric chemistry. So it means that you can bring, you can at least understand where your science fits into a larger context. If you, if you've had a bit of a diverse background and you're willing to, to talk to other people, the, the whole field of fire science is, is, um, there is a there is a type of science where people think about how you control burning and how and what does this mean and then the links to climate change are, are really strong. So my feeling is that wildfires are unfortunately not going away and they're becoming more and more relevant in terms of, of air quality and human health, but also in terms of climate. So I think anyone who's interested in this should find a background that they're excited about, but the strongest science is done at the interface of different fields. And so I think um, I think anybody willing to, to learn a little bit about a different type of science is going to bring a strength to the topic. That's perfect. Alex or Christina, do you have anything to add to that? Um, if I go first. Um, yeah, I, I agree with uh, Devi that I think like, I will say any STEM uh, major science, technology, uh, engineering, math, could help because like I, in my wildfire research, I mean, well, first I'm, I'm chemist too. So I'm biased as a heavy thing chemistry that already Sarah and mentioned. But at the same time, I actually work with other people like Christina, soil scientists, and even a biologist, like how to protect the animal, you know, the salmon after, you know, the wildfire, they may be a problem on that. Um, some, how to protect the tree, you know, make sure they are not, you know, burning prescribed fire, there's forestry. So as long as I would say, and also let me think, think about math. Some people doing modeling, how does the room, how the smoke, you know, disperse. So that's, it's all kind of uh, major, we need we require heavy thing to, to, to fight a wildfire, not just chemists. So I think most important that you look for the something you like, and then, you know, to look for the wildfire climate change impact, and we can, we, we will need you anyway from, 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 from that. So that, that's why I say, as long as you're doing the STEM education, it will be helpful for the future. But Christina, you don't have to be a chemistry background to get into wildfires, is that right? Yeah, no, but I actually agree with all that uh, the other people in the panel have said. I just want to add something that I, you know, I think lab work and modeling, remote sensing, all that is really important for sure. We really need to understand the processes and, and we really need to control conditions. And sometimes we just need to be in the lab. There is no other possibility, but I would I advise everyone to go, go out and get their hands dirty, you know, and watch a fire if you can, maybe from the distance, if it's, if it's a fire, wildfire, maybe you shouldn't even watch it from the distance, if it's one of your big fires there, but a prescribed fire, or even your bonfire, when you are, you know, roasting your marshmallows, just think about everything that is going on there, or go for a hike in a post-fire landscape, because you would be very surprised, like, uh, some post-fire landscapes are actually very high in biodiversity, for example. So fire is not only bad, fire is part of our natural system, and it's really important to understand that as well, and to understand what the, the things, for example, the things that burn and the things that don't burn, like, for example, trees don't burn, right? It's, and people who have been in post-fire landscape is it's very obvious, but some people who hasn't seen, haven't been, uh, uh, haven't seen a fire, think that the trees get completely combusted. So anyway, that would be my recommendation for students: go there, get hands on, get dirty, and yeah, enjoy. 
It's really perfect. Um, it's tempting to end the panel there, but I do have one more question. And uh, and basically, you know, the, one of the motivations for this series of panel discussions that the Royal Society of Chemistry has put together is the lead up to the, um, the International uh, Climate Conference in Glasgow um, later this month and in early November. Um, and so I thought I'd give anyone here a chance to basically, you know, see if they can, you know, just in case President Biden is watching, uh, you know, this, uh, this, <laughs> this panel discussion, um, but, you know, or give a, basically give some input about what you think could be improved or a goal or, um, uh, you know, something to work on on an international basis in, when it comes to fires, um, when it comes to uh, climate change. Um, so it's pretty open, but does anyone have something you want to say there? I I certainly do, and that's the wildfires are they they don't they don't respect boundaries. They don't they don't respect the the line between Canada and the United States. They they move, and so they are, and they affect human health, and they they do it very directly and very visibly, and and the best way to reduce all of these massive wildfires that we are now having on a regular basis is to reduce our carbon dioxide emissions. They're, these are really being driven by climate change. And so I think um, if, if I could have one message to the, to the folks making actual decisions at COP26, it's that, that wildfires are, are, are this, this massive increase that we're seeing. It's driven by many factors, but a very clear one is climate change. And, and so the best way to uh, reduce the incidence of wildfires uh, and to make them less of an issue to affecting people is is to really implement stringent controls on greenhouse gases. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, and I guess we can. I can I speak for everyone when I say that you guys would not be that upset, you, even as people who study wildfires, if there were fewer wildfires. <laughs> Very good. Okay, well, I guess with that, then um, I will uh, bring the panel to a close. Um, so thank you, um, Delphine, Sarah, Alex, Christina, thank you to all of the, um, the, the attendees. Um, thanks to the audience. Thanks to the Royal Society of Chemistry for putting this together. And uh, I'll just say goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks so much. Bye. The chemical sciences are at the heart of sustainability solutions. Sustainability powered by chemistry.